Okay, this is video lecture 24. We are looking at the westward movement and the Jeffersonian Revolution. We have four parts today. First, the expanding republic and the Native American resistance. Second, migration and the changing farm economy. Uh, three, we're going to look at the Jeffersonian presidency. And finally, Jefferson and the West. So from its inception, the United States controlled vast territories stretching westward to the Mississippi River. Uh, by 1790, farming settlements extended into western parts of New York, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, uh, crossing or skirting the Appalachian Mountains uh, into parts of Tennessee and Kentucky. The lure of the West was strong among, among land speculators and farmer settlers, but Indian nations west of the Appalachians, the Miami, the Shawnee, the Creek, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Choctaw, uh, among others, uh, remained strong and resisted American encroachment. Under Presidents George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, a more orderly, uh, sophisticated policy to promote Indian removal uh, was developed. But warfare east of the Mississippi, notably with the Creek and the Shawnee leader uh, Tecumseh, uh, continued through the War of 1812. The character of Western settlement uh, varied considerably by latitude. Uh, the earliest Western lands to be settled uh, were in Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, and here, yeoman farmers from the Chesapeake and the Southern backcountry uh, began extending settlements even before the Revolution. Uh, to the south, in the future states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, a very different sort of Western expansion took hold as Southern planters, who were eager to profit from a lucrative new crop, cotton, uh, snapped up the most suitable lands and settled them with slaves, many of whom were imported directly from Africa before Congress closed American ports to the transatlantic slave trade in, in uh, 1808. To the north, New Englanders pressed westward from their overcrowded towns and stony farms into western New York and northern Ohio, carrying their distinctive culture along with them. Life in the West was rude and isolated. Uh, the barrier formed by the Appalachians made trade and communication with the settled East difficult and expensive. The Mississippi River uh, and its tributaries, notably the Ohio River, uh, afforded the best outlets, and the major early western trading towns, uh, Cincinnati, Louisville, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and New Orleans, uh, hugged their banks. However, downstream river traffic flowed away from major markets, and upstream traffic was difficult before the advent of the steamboat in 1817. Accordingly, early western settlers were forced to live largely from their own produce and local exchange. The expansion of commerce in the West would await the transportation revolution of the years following 1820. So now let's have a closer look at the, this westward movement and the Jeffersonian Revolution, starting with our first section, the expanding republic and Native American resistance. Invoking the treaties of Paris, uh, uh, the Treaty of Paris, viewing Britain's Indian allies as conquered peoples, the U.S. government asserted its ownership of the Trans-Appalachian West. Native Americans rejected this claim and pointed out that they had never signed the treaty and they had never been conquered. In 1784, the United States then used a uh, military threat to force the pro-British Iroquois peoples to sign the Treaty of Fort Stanwix and relinquish much of their land in New York and Pennsylvania. Farther to the west, the Indian states induced Indian peoples, I'm sorry, the United States induced Indian peoples to give up most of the future state of Ohio. The Indians formed a Western Confederacy then to defend themselves against aggressive settlers and forced a compromise peace in the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. In practice, this agreement eventually brought the transfer of millions of acres of Indian land to the U.S. government and sparked a wave of American migration into the region, resulting in new conflicts with Native peoples over land and hunting rights. Now, 
Most Native Americans resisted attempts to assimilate them into white society and they ultimately rejected European farming practices and European ways in general. So let's go to the next section, migration and the changing farm economy. The migratory upsurge of white farmers and planters brought financial rewards to many settlers and transformed the American farm economy. Uh, most migrants who flocked through the Cumberland Gap uh, were white tenant farmers and they were also yeoman families fleeing the depleted soils and the planter elite of the Chesapeake region. Uh, though most poor migrants uh, to Kentucky and Tennessee believed uh, they had a customary right to occupy waste vacant lands, so they called them, uh, the Virginia government allowed them to go ahead and purchase up to 1,400 acres of land at a time at reduced prices, uh, but they sold or granted estates of 20,000 to 200,000 acres uh, to wealthy individuals and partnerships. Now, a second stream of migrants dominated by slave-owning planters and enslaved workers moved along the coastal plain of the Gulf of Mexico into the future states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Cotton financed the rapid settlement of this region as well as the expansion of slavery into the Old Southwest as technological breakthroughs increased the demand for raw wool and cotton. And of course we're talking about industrial revolution technology uh, including the cotton gin. Seeking land for their children, a third stream of migrants flowed out of the overcrowded communities of New England, uh, of course into New York, Indiana, and Ohio. In New York, speculators snatched up much of the best land uh, and they attracted tenants to work it by offering farms rent free for seven years, uh, after which, of course, they charged rent. Uh, many New England yeomen preferred a group called the Holland Land Company, which allowed setters to outright buy the land as they worked it. Uh, but high interest rates and the lack of markets to sell their produce initially mired thousands of these freeholders in debt. Unable to compete against producers of low-priced western grains, eastern farmers changed their agricultural methods, uh, rotating crops, diversifying production, and planting year-round, uh, which increased their productivity and boosted the entire American economy. Okay, our third section then covers Thomas Jefferson and his presidency. Jefferson was the first chief executive to hold office in the District of Columbia, the new national capital. Uh, before John Adams left office, the Federalist-controlled Congress had passed uh, something called the Judiciary Act, which created 16 new judgeships and six new circuit courts. Just before leaving office, Adams filled the judgeships and courts with midnight appointments. This is a term for when the president appoints someone to a job just before he leaves. Uh, James Madison's refusal then to deliver the commission appointing William Marbury, one of Adams' midnight appointees, as a justice of the peace in DC, uh, caused Marbury to petition the Supreme Court to compel the delivery of this commission uh, under the terms of the Judiciary Act of 89. Marbury versus Madison then uh, in this court, in this case, Chief Justice John Marshall asserted the court's power of judicial review. Uh, despite this setback, Jefferson mobilized Republicans to shrink back the national government's size and power, which they believed was grossly overexpanded through Federalist policies. Republicans refused to reenact the Alien and Sedition Acts when they expired. Uh, and they also amended the Naturalization Act to, per to permit a resident alien to become a citizen after five years. Uh, and they secured the repeal of the Judiciary Act. And by doing that, they ousted 40 of Adams' midnight appointees, uh, though Jefferson allowed competent Federalist bureaucrats to retain their jobs. Uh, looking at foreign affairs, Jefferson met the crisis of the Barbary Pirates, by initially refusing to pay an annual bribe or tribute to protect American vessels in the Mediterranean. Uh, to avoid war, however, he negotiated a diplomatic settlement that eventually reduced the tribute payment. Uh, in domestic matters, Jefferson set a clearly Republican course. 
Uh, he abolished internal taxes, reduced the size of the army, and he tolerated the Bank of the United States. With Thomas Jefferson and Albert Gallatin at the helm, the national debt was reduced, and the nation was no longer run in the interests of northeastern creditors and merchants. So let's go to the last section then, Jefferson in the West. As president, Jefferson seized the opportunity to increase the flow of settlers to the West. Republicans passed laws reducing the minimum acreage available for purchase. In 1801, Napoleon Bonaparte coerced Spain into returning Louisiana to France. Then he directed Spanish officials to restrict Americans' access to the port of New Orleans. To avoid hostilities with France, Jefferson instructed Robert R. Livingston, an American minister in Paris, to negotiate with Napoleon the purchase of New Orleans. Simultaneously, he also sent James Monroe to Britain to seek its assistance in case of war with France. In April of 1803, Bonaparte, Livingston, and James Monroe concluded what came to be known as the Louisiana Purchase for $15 million dollars which equals $450 million in today's money. Since the Constitution did not provide for adding a new territory, Jefferson pragmatically reconsidered his strict interpretation of the Constitution. In 1804, Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on an expedition. Uh, they returned two years later with maps of this brand new territory and the regions beyond it. Now, fearing that westward expansion would diminish their power, New England Federalists talked openly of leaving the Union. Refusing to support secessionists, Alexander Hamilton accused their chosen leader, Aaron Burr, of participating in a conspiracy to destroy the Union. Burr then challenged Hamilton to a duel. Uh, Hamilton accepted, and Burr shot Hamilton to death. As evidenced by Burr's probable plan to either capture territory in New Spain or to foment rebellion uh, to establish Louisiana as a separate nation headed by himself, uh, the Republicans' policy of Western expansion increased party conflict uh, and generated secessionist schemes in both New England and in the West. Okay, this concludes video lecture number four. Please answer the review questions that you see at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your reading.